and we've got two great speakers for you today, David Lamb and Heather Campbell. David is a senior consultant with Target Analytics, a black bog company. He's been a prospect researcher since 1989, serving as the director of prospect research at Santa Clara University and the University of Washington. Heather is associate director of research analytics at Princeton, where she manages a team delivering analytics to support the development office. Uh, the team provides assessment of fundraising progress and pool management, utilizing modeling, visualization, and analysis. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, so great to be here. Uh, lest there be any confusion, I'm not the director of prospect research at the University of Washington today. Uh, I uh, left that uh, job in uh, 2000, and uh, so now, uh, as was mentioned, I work for BlackBod uh, in the analytics division. Um, I, as I went to sessions this morning, uh, I found myself wishing that I was going to be later in the program than I am because every session that I went to, I wrote down something that was going to be quotable in today's session. And I thought if I could just get a few more sessions under my belt, I could just simply read quotes and not have to actually give you any of my, my own uh, comments. Um, just to, let, me, let me start out. Uh, I went to um, Buck Woody's uh, presentation. Anybody went to Buck Woody's presentation on uh, big data? Uh, really, really great stuff there. Um, get the video. Um, but uh, I think I wanted to start out with one. Actually, uh, I, there, I wanted to start out with a comment that I picked up in the, the uh, presentation from the fellow from Disney. Uh, they do uh, analytics at, at Disney. Uh, what I found fascinating was uh, he started out with just some background of his own career at Disney, and he pointed out that uh, in 2008, when the recession hit, and of course all of our fundraising revenues went down, and every you know obviously uh, the the for-profit world suffered tremendously as well. Disney suffered; their stock price went down 10 percent. They, they increased the analytics division by, by 67%. So that, that spoke to me in, a, in an important way. I thought, you know, Disney knows what they're doing. They have been in, this, in their business for a long time, and they understand the power of analytics. And when times are tough, you don't cut back on analytics. You don't cut back on your research. You, you invest in it. Uh, and from there, obviously, he made the point that uh, the, the correlation is not causation, as you will have heard and will hear uh, many times, uh, the, uh, the stock price continued to go up, as in fact did the analytics team continue to increase. Um, <clears throat> what we want to do today, what Heather and I want to do today, is try and connect the dots a little bit between uh, collecting data about your prospects uh, to uh, understanding how the best way to approach those prospects is. Now, we're not going to get down to, you know, how do, how do you make the ask? That's not our, our purpose here. But uh, understanding how to go from data about the prospects to stri a strategy for solicitation. I'm going to talk more about the data side Heather's going to be uh, talking more about the strategic side of uh, what, how do you uh, translate that so that the front stage fundraisers can appropriately prioritize uh, their work. Um, and uh, in, in my world, it starts with um, predictive modeling. Uh, modeling is, uh, which, which a number of sessions, even the sessions that I've gone to today, um, uh, it come up, come, modeling comes up a lot, a statistical analysis. And uh, the uh, modeling is going to help us to answer a couple of important questions. Who and how much? Who should we ask for gifts and how much should we ask them for? Who's a great prospect for a planned gift versus who's a great prospect for a major gift versus who's likely to be loyal but will never be that, or at least not in the near future, be that major gift prospect. That's what, uh, what predictive modeling is attempting to uh, determine. 
it's not going to answer the question of how. I mean, really, how are we going to get that, that gift is the skill of your front stage fundraisers. That, they are the ones who know how to go from, uh, from a name that's been handed to them to, uh, to securing that gift. Uh, I um, was really impressed by a comment that a colleague of mine from the University of Washington made. She started out as a prospect researcher, became a front stage fundraiser, and she said, the only thing I really need in order to make a contact is a name, a phone number, and a reason to contact them. And so analytics can help you do that. It can help you prioritize that list, give you a reason to contact those, those people. I just want to look through my uh, notes from my other sessions. Ah, here's a, here's a gem that I got from Buck Woody. Strategy should drive your tactics. Strategy drives tactics. Stra the strategic question is who and how much. The tactics are those, uh, are those actions that are going to be taken by the, the front stage fundraisers. A lot of times uh, when, a, when a nonprofit organization is uh, trying to think through that question of who should we approach, uh, one of the quick answers is, well, let's find out who the wealthy people are in our file. And uh, I am certainly in favor of wealth research. Prospect research is my bag. Uh, I am, uh, know, know a lot about that and, and uh, love to talk about it. But we also have to understand the limitations of wealth research. Uh, you can find some things about wealth, uh, real estate, public company insider, stock holdings, et cetera. Well, I'm not going to read the whole list there. But the uh, point that I want to make here is that wealth, uh, public wealth research uh, will not help you find most of the wealth in your file. It's going to help you find some of the wealth in your file. It's going to help you find the obvious wealth in your file. If you've got a large file of, of constituents, uh, then, uh, then getting some, some quick uh, you know, information about the value of their real estate can help you do a quick sort. And finding those, those owners of private companies, finding the people who own expensive real estate, that can help you do a quick sort uh, through your file. But most wealth is private. Uh, you know, sad to say from a professional standpoint as a prospect researcher, glad to say as a private individual. You know, not that I've got a ton of wealth, but I'm just happy that it is private. I don't necessarily want that information to be public. Um, and so uh, if you were to go out and do wealth screening on your entire file, what you're going to find out is that most people in your file are not wealthy. Not a big surprise. But we all, what you're also going to find out is, well, what you're not going to find out is who has their wealth hidden. And that's where uh, predictive analytics can help you to uh, potentially answer some of those questions. Uh, the uh, analytical process uh, is to st start with internal data. That's something that uh, Buck Woody talked about earlier today. Identify the data that you need to use to do your analysis. Um, internal data is the starting point. Uh, what are the characteristics that you know about from your interaction with your constituents? They make gifts to your organization. You've recorded those gifts. You know their names and addresses. They attend events. They volunteer. They have an alumni status or not. All of those characteristics are things that you're assiduously recording in your databases that will help you to uh, understand something about your constituency. But uh, Buck also talked about the need to take a look at external data sets if it's appropriate. You want to use appropriate data to answer your questions. Uh, what kind of external data sets would uh, help? Well, just imagine you've got two people who you know something about. You know their age, you know because they're alumni. We'll talk about higher ed. Uh, you know their age, you know their, uh, where they went to, uh, you know, what their degree is, you know where they live, you know their giving history, at least that much. You could have two people who look identical on all of those uh, on all of those dimensions, and yet be quite different prospects. 
They could be, one might be uh, driving around an expensive car and uh, qualify and be receiving uh, um, invitations to take out loans constantly because that person has such good credit. The other person might be driving around a significantly uh, less expensive car um, and uh, has bad credit. From your standpoint, you really can't tell the difference. That's where external data can help. Uh, appending <clears throat> information about somebody's uh, buying behavior, uh, some credit variables, uh, demographic information, all of these things help to distinguish uh, prospects from each other. Uh, and uh, so you want to uh, link your internal and your external data sources. Um, I, I'm realizing there might be a question about that. I'd be happy to take questions as we go along. So if, don't hold back. Feel free to ask questions as we go along. Where do we get those internal da data sources? You can actually, uh, uh, you know, you can, you can purchase marketing data from uh, corporations like Equifax and Experian. Uh, the, the marketing data that, that corporate, that, that uh, for-profit organizations use all the time to estimate who are their <coughs> best prospects. And you can actually use that too. So at Target Analytics, when we do our analysis, we do the same thing. We collect that information from, uh, from marketing sources that help us to expand our profile, our picture of what that prospect might look like. Um, <clears throat> so the modeling process then is, is uh, pretty simple. The, uh, I mean, it's, not, it's simple conceptually. Uh, you need to know how to do uh, SAS, uh, soft, uh, SAS, SAS statistical programming and, or R or whatever your favorite uh, statistical package is. Um, but uh, you figure out what are the characteristics of the people who are performing a particular behavior and then, you, once you've got th those characteristics, you apply that model to the rest of the population to find other people who statistically look just like those people, uh, and who are, uh, but who are not yet making the major gift or making the planned gift. Uh, and that gives you a way to narrow your, your file down to a smaller portion of people that you can actually give more individual attention to. This is all, you know, as, as our, our keynote speaker was talking about this morning, uh, uh, in the fundraising world, he, he was in the coffee world, but we're all ultimately in the people business. Uh, and so we need to figure out, we can't have a personal relationship with every person in our constituency. So we need to figure out who are those people that we need to spend that, that personal time with. The statistical analysis can help us to funnel the population down to a more reasonable uh, size where we can approach that. So we, just to, to talk about the, the, the process, we gather data from the constituent database. You're going to standardize and clean that information. Uh, that's what we do. Of course, your, your data are all perfectly clean and standardized, no doubt. Um, then append the external data, uh, consumer information, behavioral information, uh, census, credit, wealth, uh, philanthropic giving information to other organizations. All of those things might become a part of the model. Uh, when, we, when we do a, this analysis at Target Analytics, we end up with over a thousand different variables that might be correlated with giving. Most of them aren't. The job of the statistician is to figure out which of those variables are highly correlated with giving and, uh, and, and then um, cre create that model. Uh, one key uh, process here that uh, was actually referenced uh, earlier today uh, in uh, the, the, big, the big data presentation, you know, I can t you can tell I'm quite a fanboy now for Buck Woody. I'm going to go out and read everything, all his blogs. But um, the uh, process starts with defining that target group, defining who are the people that we want to discover in our population so that we can look at the people who are already doing that and, and describe them. But, but when we make our model, we, spl we randomly split the database into two halves. One is the test uh, half and the other we call the holdout group, and these are the. So we do our we create our model on one half of the population. 
testing the strength of correlation of each of these thousand variables to the, uh, to, to the behavior we're trying to predict. Once we've narrowed that down to a handful of, of variables, we then will uh, see if those variables are in fact predictive of what has already happened on the holdout group. Does, does our model on the people we actually analyzed actually work when we apply it to the, the holdout group. You can imagine if you just built the model on the whole database, then every variable that uh, you, you find to be highly predictive is, uh, is kind of you know, self-evidently true. Um, if I find that uh, you know, I have a, um, that mostly my alumni make gifts to me, uh, well, that's, that's what I find out when I test the entire group. But if, what if I've got a holdout set, then I can test to see if, in fact, it was mostly my alumni in that randomly uh, selected uh, holdout set that, uh, that answers the question appropriately. This is how you can test the validity of the model within a single population. Uh, then that model uh, comes together to create your best model. And finally, you create a score. Don't worry about the formula there. The point is that each uh, variable that was discovered in your analysis, the correlation of each variable to the giving behavior, uh, gets a different weight in the model. That then model is applied to the whole pop population. Uh, and the score that uh, emerges from that analysis in a sense, re represents a probability that that person will, in fact, exhibit that behavior. Uh, one, uh, another quote uh, from uh, earlier today that I just thought um, was great. The statistical analysis is not about determining who will, in fact, perform the behavior, but it's about reducing uncertainty, right? We, you, you can't tell through statistics who is going to make the million dollar gift. What you can do is reduce the uncertainty about the smaller population that you've selected based on the model. And, when, and, and that in turn helps you to spend your time with the right people. Uh, one challenge with modeling uh, that sometimes you, you know, causes us to in fact a resort to uh, only doing wealth research uh, is that you usually don't have enough examples of those million dollar donors to make a statistically valid model. In order to identify who is uh, most likely to make a gift of any size, you need to have a certain minimum population who have actually done that, who have exhibited that behavior. Uh, well, most organizations don't have more than a, you know, five, six, 10, 20, or, or, or even less, people who have made um, that million dollar gift or that half a million dollar gift. And so uh, what uh, we've been able to do at Target Analytics is we have created a, a, what we would call a prescriptive model for likelihood to, to make a major gift. What that means is that we've uh, pooled together data sets from many different organizations uh, where we have the minimum number of examples of people who have done that gift. We can then uh, create a, a national profile of million dollar donors. It turns out, uh, in, in our, our model doesn't just look at the million dollar donors, but obviously that's who we all want to find, right? But you know, half a million, $750,000, who are those people? Those are the ones who can make the significant uh, donation and the uh, transformative donation. Uh, the, um, the, the, what we find is that at that, that very high, that principal gift level, donors don't look that different across the country. If you are able to make the million dollar gift in Seattle, you're gonna be somewhat similar to the, the person who can make that million dollar gift in San Francisco or in Omaha or in, in, uh, in New York. And so uh, the, the principal gift model uh, tends to even out some of those national differences. <clears throat> we won't go into all the details, but this is a description, right quickly, um, this is the description of our, our principal gift uh, model. Um, I'm sure you can get a copy of this. Uh, 
the, uh, the variables that we use. There's a, there's a certain amount of secret sauce, but, but the things that we find uh, important are uh, giving, to, giving uh, trends, uh, the fact that they've given to other organizations. Capacity is obviously a key uh, factor, uh, which is measured by being a part of certain affluent demographic se segments, um, but also they have to have the assets to make the, the gifts. Uh, and so these variables go into that principal gift model. Uh, once we've got that, then the data can be uh, used by your organization to, uh, to now act strategically based on the information that was found. And that's where Heather's going to take over and talk about their strategic analysis of some of their top prospects at Princeton. my timer here. I know we don't have too much time. Um, thank you, David, and good afternoon. Um, let me change. Okay. Uh, so let's take a step back from the details. Think about the big question. I think this is um, a question that many um, development analysts are looking to answer. What are, how do we best surface new opportunities for fundraising? how to identify prospect value, and how to facilitate pool management. So David talked very tactically about the first two, um, those first two phrases, and I want to spend a few minutes this afternoon talking about the latter. Um, and talking about infusing analytics into the development office and into the culture of your development office, which is not an easy thing to do. Um, incorporating modeling into fundraising is a huge step in infusing an, uh, science into the art of fundraising. In my experience, a model score is impactful in that it provides the analyst with a golden rule, but it won't in itself change the behavior of your major gifts team, at least not mine. Um, so armed with science, the analyst now needs to work within the, in the organization and within the culture to change the behavior of your major gifts team. Now, this could be done in the form of reporting metrics, uh, driving prospect research on high value prospects, and whatever means possible, facilitating uh, best practices and prospect pool management. And I don't believe that fundraising analysts are just a reporter anymore. We're now serving as guides and storytellers for our organizations, and I think we're at, at a very exciting juncture in development analytics. Uh, the tools and the technologies available to analysts are opening doors like never before. And I think for the first time since I've been in fundraising analytics, which has been a few years now, I, I really feel like we're not so behind the ball as our, our corporate counterparts. I mean, look at what Drive is bringing to the table. Look at the diverse group of people here in diverse industries. Um, you know, I'm not just attending um, nonprofit conferences anymore. I'm going to technology conferences. I'm going to BI summit and BI summits, and some of this stuff is free, and we should be jumping in. And I think that's really exciting. Um, predictive modeling has now become an accepted and sought-after practice in fundraising offices. Various advancement platforms are incorporating dashboards and custom KPIs that support more data-driven prospect management. And data visualization tools are changing the way that I do my day job, and they're beginning to change the way that operational staff communicate to our frontline fundraising staff. So I'd like to walk you through a very, very brief review of this culture change at Princeton and how the role of the analyst is changing with it. And as David mentioned, please feel free to stop me with questions along the way. So way back when, in all of 2011, we were reporting our model results via a spreadsheet. It's a little embarrassing. Um, a spreadsheet is many things, but it's not a reporting tool. I think of it more as a confirmation tool where you can really get into the weeds of your data, run your calculations, uh, data check, et cetera. If you hand this to a frontline staff, which we did, um, they will scan this list and they're going to identify the names that they already know. Uh, some of the more technically inclined may even sort the list 
and maybe even by model score, that's super. But again, they're going to look for confirmatory information. They will not take drastic action unless there is additional context that makes them comfortable with going in a new direction. For example, they might say, oh, this prospect has a high value score and he already has an FY12 target, so I'm going to schedule a visit. Or they might say, this prospect has a high value score and he received a visit last year, so I'm going to schedule a follow-up. But wait, we're assuming that the fundraiser is going to study this list and sort this list and pivot this list and take actionable steps from this list and all in a relatively short time frame while the data is still relevant. Remember our goal, to provide information that causes behavior change that produces the results that our model predicts. So toward the latter part of our capital campaign, which concluded in 2012, we ran a major gifts model. And this model was specific to the last 18 months of our campaign. In other words, who is most ready to make a capital gift? And this was one of the ways we um, visually shared this information with frontline officers along with the spreadsheet, with the names. And um, in our research group, we like to throw out this, this quote, which uh, you may or may not have heard, um, this infamous quote from Don Rumsfeld, who's also an alum. And the quote goes like this, if I don't murder it. As we know, there are the known knowns, there are the things that we know, that we know. There are, the unknown, there are the known unknowns, that is to say, there are the things that we now know that we do not know. But there are also the unknown unknowns. And these are the things that we do not know that we don't know. And this is sort of what this graph is trying to segment out for the prospect manager. It displays for each manager the, um, the value of their current pool. And the orange represents the most well-known prospects. The officer knows these prospects, and it, they intend to solicit those prospects. And then the dark gray are prospects that were identified as high value by our model, but they fall outside the prospect manager's known pool. So here we are identifying their go-tos. And the dollar value, dollar value estimate that we applied to the pool, the pool is very important and that it allows us to estimate whether the goals will be met. It helps to optimize the pipeline, it helps to allocate resources. Um, basically, we're just analyzing historical data, playing the averages, and applying the estimated yields to the current, project, current prospect pool to come up with a pool value. Um, I won't get in the, into the details of this particular algorithm, but I'm happy to share, to share that offline if you're interested. So we applied this same concept across the boards. We applied it to our regions, which were a very big component of, um, of our fundraising structure, down to the uh, sub-regional sub and the city-level breakouts, basically valuing any segment that had a cam campaign goal so we had an understanding of what areas were in danger of not meeting goal. And once again, once your whole major gifts prospect pool has a model score, this type of analysis is pretty easy to knock out. So we ended our campaign, and we breathed. And then we questioned, how do we continue making impact through the use of visual, visual information? How do we put that at the fingertips of our administrators and our frontline staff? And more importantly, how do we get out of Excel? What, where the analysis is really only as good as the day that you complete it in. We have been experiencing a move at Princeton away from visual information to what I refer to as visual analytics. As we move toward this new type of data visualization, we see a change in our analytic process. Um, analysts have been doing visual information for a long time. Visual information is most often prepared one cut at a time. In other words, 
extract your data, put it into Excel, make your chart, paste it into PowerPoint. It's usually explanatory, it's static, and the details are gathered from the bottom up. But senior management is really used to this type of reporting. However, as we begin to move toward visual analytics, the role of the analyst begins to change. At Princeton, visual, visual analytics is not only beginning to augment our business intelligence environment, it's beginning to take front and center stage. The advantage of visual analytics is that it allows you to see the shape of the whole story. It's explanatory, it's, it's, it's exploratory, it's dynamic. In other words, your data is not dead the minute you're done with your analysis. It requires new tools and it enables us to, to analyze large amounts of data using end memory processes, allowing us to do real-time analytics. Now, this means a change in the business intelligence environment. And in some cases, including ours, data architecture is a really important piece of this equation. I, you know, I'm hoping to get some tips when I'm here because I know this is one of our, still one of our pain points um, as far as data architecture and using these end memory processes. So now we are out of Excel. I really hope the guy from Microsoft is not here. Um, but, but now our, an, our analysis is dynamic, and for me, that's the biggest win. The data moves and flows with the, ideas, with the idea of the analyst and the user, and it's always real time, or very close. So I always come back to the question, what is it that changes behavior? Is it a comfort level with taking a new course of action? Is it providing additional context to convince and reassure the major gift officer that contacting this new prospect is, is the right decision? Um, the beauty of the data viz is that it's interactive. A fundraiser can click on various segments and view the detail below. The data is refreshed daily with any target information that they're updating in the system. Um, what, I always like to be in the room with a fundraiser when they act with it, interact with the data viz for the first time. I like to hear what their next question is. What's their natural next thought as they interact with the data? If it's an actionable step, great. If it's not, what's missing from the data viz? Since I'm talking so much about visual analytics, I really wanted to do less talking and more showing but it's really a pain to redact a dynamic visualization. And also I can't get out my server on this computer. So um, this is it, screenshot, um, which I believe is akin to killing a data viz. So now I'm a data viz murderer, but I love you. Um, essentially what this chart is, is doing is it's placing prospects in those segments that we discussed before. It's kind of a, a warm to cool prospect. Um, and then again, with each prospect, we developed a, um, developed a pro proposed value for that prospect. Based on our past experience and campaign, we really found that developing that value that dollar value really grabbed the frontliner's attention and gave them something to react to. This dash actually has a, a few tabs and um, that allows the user to, to pivot this information. We found that, op that often uh, fundraisers were under-targeting their prospects. Um, so we also provided visually a way to look at how widely their proposed targets were varying from the calculated, the estimated calculated targets. And of course, this was very interesting in, uh, to managers, but again, it caused behavior change and it encouraged um, our fundraisers to go back and make revisions to those target amounts. Um, and then with, with all of our published visits, a direct link is provided from the prospect name straight back into our advancement fundraising system so they can go in there, they can change target information, they can set up tasks, whatever they need to do. So it really becomes part of their workflow. So um, currently, right now, we have been embarking on a project with our gift planning team. And as you see here, it involves a whole lot of moving parts. 
But our goal is to pull all the data from all these, all these various parts together into one holistic dashboard. And that allows the gift planning team to do prospecting, utilizing the modeling scores and other contextual information. It allows them to follow key metrics so they can tweak their marketing strategies. And finally, to measure their ROI from contact to solicitation to improve their operational efficiency. So I also want to mention that visualization is also a great tool for exploring defining metrics. I think one of the really exciting and challenging things about our field is that we don't have a catalog of hard and fast KPIs. We have some, but there are a lot of gaps. Um, so for example, over the past several months, one of, my, one of my staff, and he's here, Jim Gibbon. Raise your hand, Jim. He's been working um, really closely with our stewardship team to come up with some of these uh, stewardship and donor relation metrics. Now, it's a pretty tough job to sit down with the frontline staff and ask them, what, what do you want to see on a report or a dashboard? And I actually think that's kind of unfair. Um, but with data visualization, the analysts can explore and compose a holistic understanding of the business topic based on the data. And then by allowing the staff to see their business, we elicit some of those really important questions. So developing the dashboard is a very iterative experience and should not be done via a set of user requirements. Um, so again, this is something that Jim has been working on, composing and defining these stewardship and donor relation metrics. Um, we're attempting the same process with our athletics Friendsgiving groups, um, and as I mentioned, with our gift planning team, and the list goes on. So what I find that with data visualization is that we are not rerunning our analysis, so we are answering more questions. And happily, the questions are never ending. Um, but at the end of the day, I'm a fundraising analyst. I'm not a marketing analyst. I'm not a pharmaceutical statistician. I work with fundraisers. And it takes more than a probability score to get a frontline staff to visit a capital prospect. So understanding that and taking on the role of storyteller and guide to our, our organizations, I think can have a really powerful outcome. So I hope we've provided you with some very tactical information, as well as an understanding of the importance of communicating visually and holistically. And with that, I believe we have plenty of time for questions. If there's any questions, yes. It was a capacity rating score, but we really segmented down even further than that. We used affinity, and um, we really looked at averages of those groups based on past giving. And then we looked at not only estimated yield, but what was the success ratio? How likely was that particular segment to make a gift or not? Right, we discounted based on yield, and then we also discounted based on success ratio. So it was pretty conservative. Okay, thank you. She asked if the gift officers were used to seeing a dollar value assigned to their prospects, and the answer, right. Oh, um, no, no, which is why they reacted to it. <laughs> Um, and often they kept it, they just kept it. They said, all right, that seems reasonable. You know, other times it was like, I know that prospect, I know what the amount, and sometimes it was higher. A lot of times it was lower. Um, but it gave them something to react to, which I didn't really expect. I'm like, that's great. It's almost like they had to fix it. You know, they're like, that's not right, I'm gonna fix it. So whatever works. Yes. So there's a couple slides back you had quite a few um, data points listed. And I'm wondering how many of those you take back to your advancement database or how many just live in your uh, data analytics program? 
Okay, so she was asking about a number of metrics. I'm, Right. Um, they all live in our advanced database except for the unrealized value and the estimated pool value, which was our calculated value. Um, that was a good question, and I don't, she asked what was the resistance to using math in constructing that value score that we provided them, is that right? Uh, there was not much. We gave them a very simple explanation of the algorithm that we used. Um, we kind of walked them through, you know, a, a couple different calculated fields, you know, here's the yield on a particular segment, here's now their unrealized value, and then the next step would be, well, we minus out any historical giving by that particular prospect. Here's what's possibly left on the table. Um, and and they, were, they were fine with that. I don't think they want too much math. <laughs> sure. But the, the important piece was that they knew that they could change that. This was not in the database. So this was an encouragement to react to that. Hmm? Yes? Um, they would go into our advancement system and enter a target amount. Yeah, I mean, really the only, where, the only place this graph exists in our dashboard you know, which was shared with, with senior management, et cetera. And it would, the great thing about this is it's refreshed every day. As soon as their target information is in there, it overrides that calculated value. We have time for one more question. Or none, that's fine too. Oh, there we go. Part. What's the visualization tool? Um, it's Tableau, Tableau dashboards. We're also right. up on server, so everyone in our office can log in. I'm happy to share any of our dashboards um, from my laptop if anyone is interested. Thank you for so much for joining us. Thank you.